developing and establishing both a personal brand in public. Not only did I have three solid, like on paper job offers that aren't getting work, job market's a little different now, but they're not getting work because they don't. Um, Would you like to go to the conference? So I wound up going to the Alteryx conference last year. Don't do tricks to get people to read your content. The if, focus you, of if you come up to them with tricks, you're going to be known for tricks. Mm-hmm. My goal is to get people comfortable enough with it. Welcome to today's episode of the Data Talk with Doers. Today we have a very special guest, Albert, Albert Blemmy, who brings a unique blend of military experience and data expertise to the table. With a decade of service in the United States Marine Corps, he has honed his skills in problem solving and strategic thinking. Our guest then transitioned to a career in data where he has made significant contributions to various organizations. As a business analyst, ministry fellow with Google's Next Home division, he devised a plan for competitive product research that resulted in improving reporting consistency and reduced work redundancy. He is also a seasoned marketing analyst with expertise in multi-touch attribution and marketing mix modeling. Not to mention, he's an expert in business intelligence platforms like Altrix and Salesforce Marketing Cloud Intelligence. And as if they weren't enough, uh, he now s- serves as a customer training instructor for Altrix, a leading software company that is designed to make advanced analytics accessible to any data workers. He's also a highly respected social media influencer on LinkedIn with over 20,000 followers who eagerly follow his insights on data, career coaching, resume writing, and personal branding. It's my pleasure to introduce our guest today, a true leader in the field of data and marketing. Thank you very much, Nima. That uh, that was an amazing introduction. I was kind of uh, I was trying not to smile. I was like, "Wow, I, I sound very impressive." <laughs> Thank you. I, I have imposter syndrome like anybody else, so I'm like, "Did, did I really do all that?" <laughs> you do you do have impressive background? I I think this was like limited. I I, I was kind of trying to cut short. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's some oh. some stuff on there. You've got to you got to separate the wheat from the chaff sometimes, as we say. <laughs> right, right. So uh, let me get started with your background and transition with uh, to data analytics, uh, Albert. So sure. Can we have a bit of a background about you, rather than what I've been mentioned? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I um, yeah, growing up, I kind of lived all over the place and. I think that um, gave me kind of a mental flexibility just from from a very young age. Uh, I was born in the United States at four. My family moved to Australia. I lived there for several years and uh, moved back to America. And um, you know, just kind of went all over. My my journey was uh, was a bit wandering. I started college, decided that wasn't for me at one point, midway to my bachelor's degree, and so I dropped out and joined the Marine Corps. Um, in the Marine Corps, I eventually finished my degree. And so I went from the enlisted ranks into the officer ranks, switched jobs there. And so all of these big life changes, uh, led me to, to a lot of different perspectives and a lot of sort of intellectual mental flexibility, if you will. Around that same time, I, I got married had children, uh, you know, lived in all sorts of different places, deployed on military exercises all over the world, deployed to combat zones. And so you just in seeing and meeting all sorts of different people, experiencing other cultures, uh, being in, in austere and difficult environments, all of these things lead you to, to be able to attack a problem set in, in a multitude of different ways and to be able to draw on some really incredible life experiences and, um, yeah, so really, I once I made the decision to retire from the Marine Corps, there was only one job for me, and that was data analytics, which is something that I'd always had a love for. So yeah, my next question was that what motivated you to like make the switch from uh, your uh, military career to data analytics? Because uh, is there any motive, or is it because you love like what you mentioned? You you loved it, right? Yeah. It, I like to joke that when I was a kid, all I really wanted to do was solve math problems and play war. And so I got to not play war for, you know, went to a couple of actual wars, but uh, 
got to to be a marine for about half of my life and then when that was uh when it was time to move off of that there was only a, a, one other job for me and that was just just cracking different difficult problems with uh with some math skills and along the way i was fortunate enough to earn my master's degree in analytics through a, a military graduate school and yeah, so I was I was kind of blessed in a way because a lot of people coming out of the military have a very difficult time with trying to figure out what they want to do sort of in their next life. Uh, I, I did not have that challenge at all. I knew exactly what I wanted to do. The only challenge was to establish myself and get into it and get work. Yeah, so uh, so when you, were, when you had the decision, like you took the decision of uh, getting into data career, so what were the challenges that as a, as a uh, newbie into the field, what were your challenges when you're transitioning? A lot of them have not really come into focus until recently, because I think at the time that I was going through them, I didn't, uh, I didn't, I wasn't really even smart enough to figure out that they were significant challenges. Um, and it was just one of those things where you just kind of take one bite at a time and, and eventually you're, you're, you're through the problem. And so, I don't think, I think a lot of the things that got me through the, the challenges that are there to new entrant, entrants in the field mm -hmm. didn't occur to me because I just sort of naturally gravitated to the way or the, or the best way for me to get through that problem. And that was developing and establishing both a personal brand in public and building an effective network that could get me opportunities. And those opportunities came in all sorts of different ways, large and small. I opened up opportunities for other people along the way. But really, when, when you're talking about the big hurdle of getting that first job in data analytics, that was very easy. By the time I, I got to the point where it was, it was time to choose one or, or to try and get one, because I had established so many connections and so much confidence in myself through building the brand and the network, that not only did I have three solid, like on paper job offers by the time I left the Marine Corps, um, I, I had two or three others that, you know, had I pursued them would have been legitimate job offers. They were kind of soft verbal offers. And so there was never a question of whether or not I was going to be able to get a job with the salary that I wanted in the field that I wanted. It was a question of which one was the best, which is very advantageous position. Since then, in helping other people, I've, I've seen the challenges that were actually there that didn't seem like much at the time because of the steady work that I did to get through them. I, I see people that are immensely qualified, probably more qualified than I was when I got my first job, that aren't getting work. Job market's a little different now, but they're not getting work because they don't have the name out there and they don't have the connections that I did. So um, one thing I always wanted to ask many data influencers is that uh, there are too many courses available in the market. I, I think it's like too many is also not that good. So how did you manage to find the right courses or what, were, what was your strategical decision on uh, taking up certain courses for landing up uh, your job? So just one thing I'd like to circle back to. Uh, my bachelor's degree is in economics, so as an economist, I can say there is no such thing as too many courses. The courses all exist because someone uh, had some incentive to make them. So, um, yeah, but there are, you are correct in, in saying that there are a lot of bad courses out there. There are a lot of very mediocre courses out there. There are a lot of things that just aren't worth the money and time, especially, that people are investing in them. And it it can be very easy. The trap that you fall into is that you get into a course and you either you either quit because on, on something that can be effective because you get frustrated or it's just not speaking to you or you maybe probably even worse is you get into a course that isn't very effective and you keep with it because you you're just determined and you have discipline and you want to once you started it, you want to complete it. And so it can be very difficult, especially for a new entrant to the field, to figure out the happy medium there where can you figure out early on this course of study 
is not effective for me. I need to change to something else. But if a course of study is at least somewhat effective, should I stick with it because I've already invested some time and it's worth completing? Um, you, you can't go too far wrong with the, if you go to one of the major sites, Udemy, Coursera, um, edX, any of these kind of big money, big volume educational sites. If you go in there and look at the ratings, if they have a ton of ratings and a ton of, and, and they're very high, it's, it's pretty reasonable that that's going to be a good course. Um, if you go on Coursera and you find Andrew Eng's machine learning course, and it has millions of people that have completed it and rated it, and it's at a 4.8, there's no way you can fake that. If you go find a, a brand new course and it has five ratings and it's a 4.8, maybe take that with a grain of salt because there are people out there that are gaming the game and, and making a, a junk course, something that's not effective, and then going in and having you know their circle of friends go in and rate it. There, there are pods for course ratings. It's, you know, it's scummy and it's dishonest, but it happens. So... But if you see something that's kind of well worn and um, and and people have done it and agree that it's very good, that that's a safe bet. Also, you can go to there. There are tons of people online. Alex Freeberg is one who consistently takes courses and rates courses, and he's done so many. His his word is pretty much bond as far as uh, rating a course goes. So uh, starting this year, you uh, started with an exciting role uh, of a customer tra training instructor. And uh, yep. you recently mentioned in a post that uh, that is the reason why you have always mentioned LinkedIn helped me to get this job. So can you elaborate because that's what every one of us want to get, right? We don't want to be uh, searching a job in a traditional method. It's, it's always LinkedIn work for us in terms of uh, getting the offers. So can you elaborate on that? Uh, how did you uh, manage to get a job through LinkedIn? Sure. Um, first of all, apologize for the noise. We are dog sitting for a, an elderly friend and uh, the dog is very large and somewhat loud. Um, let, me, let me go back to the, the previous job. So I was a marketing analyst and I started that in September of 2021. Mm -hmm. And when I first got there, they, we started doing, we were doing a lot of things in Excel. I was learning the, the uh, technology that they had contracted, which is a Salesforce technology, marketing cloud intelligence, um, which I kind of mixed reviews on. I, I never used it enough to get very good at it, but I, I didn't find it very intuitive. Okay. So I started working with Alteryx, which they had really just started using. And... I took to it very quickly. Um, the user interface just works very well with the way I think. I found it, I found it very challenging, but in a positive way to learn it. Um, it was very easy to pick it up and immediately start working with it. You saw immediate benefits to kind of alleviate yourself from Excel button mashing. Um, and so I saw a payoff right away. I saw, you know, it was almost like playing a video game. Um, you, get, you get kind of these immediate payoffs to get you addicted to it. And then you can learn and learn and learn. And before you know it, you're just, you're kind of an expert at it. And so I really enjoyed it. I immediately started like most things that I enjoy professionally. It's, it's going to be in a LinkedIn post and probably quite a few of them. Um, I, I post every day habitually. So... You know, there's no shortage of topics that, that need to come out there. If you're posting probably 350 to 360 times a year, you're, you're going to talk about things. And so I started talking about Alteryx and I started connecting with people in the Alteryx community. Um, before I knew it, I became kind of the leader at Analect for using Alteryx. And when a project came up involving uh, Disney and a, an infographic that was built for the Disney client, they were looking around for someone to take over this project and it fell to me. Extremely challenging project, very, just a massive workflow and very challenging. And honestly, when I first took it on, I wasn't sure I could be successful with it. And so that increased my learning curve exponentially with Alteryx. And the man that was handing the project off to me happened to say at one point as we were training, 
um, would you like to go to the conference? I, so I wound up going to the Alteryx conference last year, met a lot more people. There are quite a few transitioned military working in Alteryx. And so I made a name for myself in the, the Alteryx community, both as a kind of a problem solver and a worker, but also as a, as a personality, as someone that was kind of out in the open and, and talking about my affinity for the platform. So late last year, Alteryx decided they had always done third party education. They contracted with other companies to teach the software externally. They decided that they were going to get into the business of teaching their own software with an internal team, and they never had that before. So they started building it. And Alteryx has a way of kind of bringing all of the Alteryx aficionados into the mothership at some point. And so uh, Esther Cohen Besbrodko, who is an Alteryx ace, but had always been external to the company before, was hired to lead the instructor team. When she got hired, she reached out to a handful of people and said, who do you know that, that might want to join the instructor team? And I said, me. And so I had met Esther through, through LinkedIn, had, had then met her at the Inspire conference last year, but, um, you know, had, had connected with her, had conversed with her through the platform. And really most of the people that I knew at Inspire were, you know, kind of my LinkedIn heroes. And, and so it was like meeting an athlete in real life or, or something like that. You're kind of starstruck at first. Um, but yeah, just, just meeting and getting to know those people through that platform, which really, you know, when you think about it, it's not possible without an internet networking platform. And so, yeah, LinkedIn absolutely not only helped me get this job, but I'm pretty sure it would have been next to impossible for me to get the job without use of LinkedIn. Wow, yeah. Yes, uh, Albert, that was quite a journey. I think um, uh, it was like inspiring for me, like to try out things in LinkedIn as well. So yeah. uh, I'm sure this this is definitely going to be useful for the viewers because all of us are trying to go towards that direction of using LinkedIn for uh, getting the offers um, without much effort. So yeah, so uh, that thanks for sharing that. If I could just uh, add something to to what you just said. Um, right. So of course, being being in the data industry, the data domain, whatever we're, we're going to call it, um, I had never been exposed to so many people from India before. And so it's been quite fascinating for me to learn about the culture and the people and, and especially through the way that Indian people use LinkedIn, the differences between the, the men and the women, how they, you know, whether or not they smile in their pictures, whether or not they will uh, exchange messages with me. I'm fascinated by all of that. And I just want to say is a tribute to you uh, because y you have just gone way, way out of your way to uh, to really lean forward and engage and, and be friendly with, you know, not only me, but, you know, lots of people on LinkedIn. And I know that that's a difficult hurdle to cross because I've I've talked with you and a lot of other Indian people about the the social hurdles and the societal expectations that you have to overcome. So tribute to you for that. And, uh, you know, that's I really enjoy our connection because of that. Sure. Sure. Yes, Albert. Uh, the thing is that I am totally inspired by people around LinkedIn because when you see several posts, uh, like that people are uh, putting their journey, they're sharing their knowledge. Mm -hmm. It's like, why can't even we do it? Right. So that's what, yeah. like I started doing it. And by the way, I'm an introvert. So it is, kind of hard for me to like yep, me really too. push myself uh, out there so yeah, yeah. so the uh, next question what i would like to know is what advice would you give uh, the old albert the 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 one that you started right uh, new albert in terms of pursuing a change yeah I've, so i've always wrestled with this question and i think i talked about this actually at my retirement from the marine corps that it never it never makes sense to me the people that say i have no regrets um, because that just, that just seems illogical to me. If you could go back in time and, and watch yourself about to make some catastrophic mistake, would you not step in and, and correct it? I mean, that's almost like saying you learned nothing from it to me, but over time I've become comfortable with, I love where I am today and I have learned to love the person that I am today. And I know that there are there are so many positive things about 
who I've become that came from even negative experiences in my past, horrible mistakes that I made, you know, bad things that happened to me that were circumstantial or that were just, you know, bad actors interfering with my life, my career. And all of those things led me to where I am today, which is a great place. And, I, and I'm very, very content, very excited about where I am right now. And so I, I don't know if this, this is kind of rambling and I don't know if this is where you were getting to. What I would teach myself early on, I think I would just, I mean, really the things that I regret that I would go back and change are, are more just kind of getting my act together at a slightly younger age. Um, I was terrible with my finances for, for quite some time, so it doesn't really relate to data analytics, but just to try and convince myself to be a little bit more responsible from a younger age. Um, but, it, but it's tough to go back and say, let me tweak something that could, that could have led to me being a different person than I am today, because I've, I'm quite happy with who I am today and, and with where I'm going. So, um, so now that we have covered your, um, your data analytics career, uh, um, Albert, so the one thing that I cannot uh, separate you from another topic is LinkedIn branding. So uh, that's something that we all uh, correlate with Albert Blemmy and LinkedIn branding. So the first thing is that um, we w I want to know like when you started your job search uh, coming from um, like switching from um, military to data analytics. Uh, mm -hmm. Did you get, uh, did you like literally thought that, okay, I'm going to start building a LinkedIn um, brand or just uh, start with a traditional approach of job search? Uh, no, not at all. And it really, it just started with kind of having fun. Um, so I, I started with, I started going to webinars that were available to veterans that were transitioning or service members transitioning out of the military. And they focused on use of LinkedIn, how that can enable you to have a successful transition. And at the time I was thinking pretty small. I just thought, you know, they recommended that you get 500 connections, make them productive connections. And, and they will, some of them will yield employment opportunities. So I, at the time, my goal was let's connect with hiring managers and, um, you know, kind of mid-level people that are a level or two above where I want to get hired as an entry level or maybe, you know, kind of one up level analyst. And so that was the, that was the goal and just research companies, find out about domains that, that might be interesting to, to be an analyst in. And so that was just me taking small nibbles of the apple at first the the kind of LinkedIn influencer thing came as an offshoot of I started watching a podcast. I then got invited to in interaction with interactions with the podcaster. I got invited to help him out on social media because he didn't feel like he was doing well on LinkedIn. And so I started managing the the LinkedIn account and trying to boost viewership and, and get those people on LinkedIn over to the, the YouTube and the podcast. And then along the way, I started experimenting with Instagram and Twitter. And uh, at one point, I half jokingly named myself the, the podcast social media manager. And so that was kind of a laugh for a while. But then it became true. I was managing all of the social media other than publishing the YouTube videos themselves, but I was promoting the shows. I was dealing with the guests. I was even booking some guests myself from people that I had met. And so all, all of that kind of grew my, for a while I was very focused on growing the presence of the show. And then that in, in some kind of cross promotional things wound up growing my presence and as I transitioned off of working for that show, because I ran out of time basically with, with doing work with my internship and then with full-time job, I took a lot of those lessons learned from promoting the show and the organizational page and brought them over to my profile. And that's when I started getting, you know, tens of thousands of followers in far in excess of my connections, which is, you know, I think when you become a quote unquote influencer, 
that's when when you get more people following you than you're actually you know engaging with personally that's that's when you know okay my content is is more valuable to most of these people than like my personal whatever i can offer them personally yeah yes uh, alert so the the one that you mentioned right so even i came across your profile when you started uh, talking on that podcast on the mm-hmm. youtube and linkedin so i think people uh, started recognizing you uh, from that journey onwards and that's when we all started correlating you with linkedin branding and um, so what are uh, some of the best practices uh, for creating an engaging and valuable content on linkedin because there are sometimes i i say that there are some posts that are not uh, i i feel it's uh, linkedin is kind kind of being an instagram or a facebook so we we want it Uh, to have a uh, like an engaging and valuable content so what are the best practices that you would advise really it's the rules that i put forth in linkedin hard mode and it's um just just limit your your use of the tricks that dominate other platforms and so you mentioned that Yeah, sometimes it looks like there's posts on LinkedIn where people kind of raise their eyebrows and say, "Eh, is, shouldn't this be on Instagram or shouldn't this be on Facebook or there's room for personal content on LinkedIn. Um I I don't personally go for uh connect with or or follow people that do like wall-to-wall personal content, but um yeah, the the best practices I tried to sum up in the challenge and a lot of those are just kind of don't don't do tricks to get people to read your content the focus of the challenge is to get people to make good content and so let your content be the winner be the the hook that gets people to engage rather than let me tag all of my friends to compel them to respond or let me put 50 hashtags on this thing in an effort to to grab as many eyeballs as possible linkedin is set up to punish those things because they see other platforms and they see how creators on instagram put 50 hashtags on their on their picture in order to kind of game the game and get get random people to look at their picture and increase their reach linkedin doesn't want that so the more hashtags you put on there the the less your reach is um it gets it gets tagged as spam the more people you tag on there that don't respond your reach decreases because it gets tagged as spam and so never mind the fact that you're annoying your friends so that you know that's just bad anyway um and so that's why i put the guidelines of the challenge the way i did because i want people to focus on for 30 days every day you focus on your content and let your content be the thing that that lets you succeed or fail and then that the reinforcement that you will get is on your content and on how you post and it won't be on whether or not you mastered the sort of social media hijinks that will falsely inflate or deflate reaction uh, my next question was that actually you said right uh, not to put lot of uh, hashtags and uh, mm-hmm. linkedin will actually put you like It, that's not how linkedin wants us to um, promote our content so what is the best way so you mean to say is the content the prime factor for um, getting your brand up or promoting your brand yeah absolutely because right. it's always useful to think of being on linkedin as just a the intent for linkedin is to make a digital version of an in person networking event so you imagine just going into a room with a bunch of people that you want to impress they're their data hiring managers or kind of low level C suite people department heads that sort of thing these are people that you want to connect with if you walk up to them and and you immediately start going on some hot button political topic or you you immediately go up to them and say i know these people and you start listing your your 50 best connections or you walk up to them with with some sort of like magic trick or something you know you, you imagine those are not going to lead to productive connections you might get a raised eyebrow uh you might get a chuckle out of one or two of them but they're not going to sit there and think this is a person that I want to hire 
If, however, you go up to them and you strike up an, an engaging conversation and you, and you say, well, I, you know, my name is Al and uh, you shake hands and then you say, you know, I read this article the other day about machine learning and the effect of chat GPT on, um, on whether or not uh, programmers are, are going to be effective coders in the future. You know, is that, is that something interesting to you? Then you're going to be memorable in a good way, in a professional way. And you're going to kind of catch, catch eyeballs and catch attention for things that will make you seem to be a hireable candidate. So that's why I just, I kind of discourage the use of tricks because just think of it like meeting a real person. If you, if you come up to them with tricks, you're going to be known for tricks. If you come up to them with intelligent conversation, you will be known for that. And they will know you as someone that's personable and intelligent. And that's likely to be someone that they'd consider hiring for their company. How do you measure the success and impact of, uh, of your LinkedIn branding? Because I don't, I don't know if it is the number of followers or likes or views. I'm not sure. So I would like to hear from an expert like you, like what are uh, uh, the... How, how, how can one person measure the success? So the, the metrics are nice. And I think sometimes they get unfairly labeled as vanity metrics. Um, if you use them to feed your vanity, then okay, whatever. Um, and, and it is pretty cool when you put a post out there and you, you're kind of going, you know, it's like putting sending your children out into the world. You're, you're like, these are my thoughts. Please don't be mean to them. And when that post generates... 10,000 impressions or 20,000 or 50,000 and and the reaction is mostly positive and that the responses are constructive and interesting and you, you, you feel good about that that's there's no there's no two ways about it it's you know a digital version of going and meeting someone and they smile at you and they're they're fun to talk to and and you you both approve of each other and now it's a productive relationship so yeah there's nothing there's nothing wrong with wanting attention and approval, even in social media. It's kind of what social media is about. But the, um, I, I think you have to measure it. First of all, you have to work out what, what's your why? Why are you on social media? Why are you on LinkedIn in particular? Are you there to get, if you're unemployed, you're there to get a job, presumably. If you're employed, but kind of underemployed or unsatisfied, you're there to scout for a better job or um, if you're in sales or you have a company, you're looking for customers, variety of different things you could be on there for. You have to kind of figure out, well, what's, what's your end game and what's the way to get there? And I doubt that any end goal is enabled by a specific follower count. And so I'm starting to get close to the 25,000 follower territory. No goal that I have requires 25,000 LinkedIn followers to be achieved. Um, and, and honestly, the, the you know, lucrative opportunities I've had really can be traced back to 20, 30, maybe 50 connections that I've made. But there's no way of knowing which ones those are. So it's always good to kind of spread your efforts wide. And the more followers you have, the more chances you have of having that kind of jackpot connection that offers you that your dream job. Um, so the, the success really is just, are you getting the opportunities that you want? And so when I got the opportunity to work at Alteryx and I actually got another job offer at the same time to, to join a data science team, that was my, my success metric. I got, you know, and it was two things. I got two job offers for fantastic jobs. The other job would have been amazing as well. It was a difficult decision. And so that's, yeah. that's what looks like winning for me. So I, I was thinking more of into the numbers perspective, but uh, what you said is really true. We all have a why, right? To why we are posting on LinkedIn. Yeah. So, yeah. So now that we talked about what needs to be done in LinkedIn, what are the don'ts that we have to make sure that we don't do in LinkedIn? So, I mean, I posted today and, and I think you saw it about kind of my favorite LinkedIn topic, which is when you request a connection with someone, send them an introductory message. There is some debate about this. 
if you already know the person or if you already had extensive conversation with them, at least on LinkedIn, it's probably not necessary. I mean, you're known commodity at that point. But if you're co kind of cold reaching out to someone, if you're sending a cold message to a hiring manager or someone that you're you're targeting as, hey, this is this is someone that I need to be connected with, you should send them a message. And I, in in all the time I've been using the platform, I've never seen a reason not to, in spite of some well thought out arguments from people that, that I know and respect. So that's probably number one is don't fire off a bunch of connection requests with no message. Tell people why you want to connect with them. And that leads to a productive connection in my experience. Um, what else? Make, and I think you can extend that to everything. Make your, make your efforts on LinkedIn meaningful. So when you put out a post, there's no reason to, even for hard mode challengers, if, you, if you're having a drive spell, there's no reason to put out a funny meme and say, happy Thursday. That, that does nothing for you. I would, honestly, I would rather people just miss a day if they've got nothing than putting junk like that out there because it, that's just a, a waste of time and energy. In your, in your engagements on, you know, go out there and freely engage on other people's content. Say, think about their content, read it, process it, think about how it makes you feel. What is it? What is it? What is your response? What questions do you have? So that way, when you drop down into comments, you don't say CFBR, commenting for better reach, great post, the 100 degree. None of that helps overly much. When someone creates content, when they take the time to put their thoughts out there and that means something to you and it, it evokes a response, make it a meaningful response. Go, go in there and say, I loved this point that you made. I had a question about this. Have you thought about this other thing? Now you're, you're advancing the conversation. And again, you think about it as an in-person networking event. If, if you're up there talking to someone and everything they say, you're like, yep, agree 100%. I'm, I'm all with you. Everything you say is right. They're quickly going to get bored with talking to you and they're going to see you as a, as a non-entity. You're at best a, a low grade cheerleader. But if you, if you respond to their thoughts with yes, and have you thought about this as well? Or I read an article the other day that disagrees slightly with what you say. What do you think about that? Then they're going to see you as a, a thinking person and a valuable connection um, you know, conversationalist, something that, that has, has real value in their sphere, in their, um, in their area. So, yeah, that, uh, totally makes sense, Albert. So the one thing that I also resonate is the sending re uh, request without a message. So I, I, I saw your post for today, so I totally resonate, uh, yeah. with what you mentioned, uh, on that uh, aspect. And uh, and you also mentioned the LinkedIn hard mode challenge, right? And uh, and including me, there are a lot of people uh, challenging. I mean, challenging themselves to post daily basis. And uh, and for someone who's starting new, like for example, if this is the the person is first time attempting for this challenge, uh, he or she might have feel felt overwhelmed. So what are they are what what tips do you um, suggest, like? The co content, uh, I mean, putting content online shouldn't be stressful for them, right? So, uh, what what are your suggestions? Uh, I mean, shouldn't it be stressful? It's sometimes stress brings out the best in people. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't really believe in telling people how to feel about something. Um, your your human response is valid, and so. If the thought of posting original content for 30 straight days stresses you out, well, then it stresses you out. And the question is, can you turn that stress into something positive? Can it, you know, does, does the pressure turn the coal into a diamond or, you know, or does it make you crumble? Um, and so I feel pressure sometimes to perform. Creating content is not a, a pressure packed thing for me anymore. It's, it's a daily habit now. And I, my goal is to get people comfortable enough with it that I, I'm not in it to, to make everybody a 20,000 follower micro influencer. 
my goal is to get people to the point where they're not terrified to create content that they are not, that they know that they can put their thoughts out there and not get crushed and that they can approach people for networking opportunities. And most people are not going to be mean to you. And that in, in 30 days, you're going to have to come up with some things that maybe you didn't think of at the start of the month. Very few people sit there at the start of the month and list 30 topics and say, I'm going to post this on Monday, this on Tuesday, this on Wednesday. Some people will do like a week in advance. But um, it's the pressure is going to force you to come up with something when you wake up in the morning and say, I got nothing. And, and what do you do at that point? Because that's a very real professional situation that happens. Um, it's a very real personal situation. It happens. Uh, somebody comes to you with a problem and you, you're kind of bereft of like, what do I tell them? What, how do I help them? Um, so that, that just comes up in, in real life. Like, what do you do when, when you start thinking and you draw a blank? Uh, do, do you come up with something passable? Do you, can you find a minimum valuable product, if you will, and, and have it be enough for that day or that situation? Or do you, do you kind of quit and freak out? Um, sometimes people go from quitting and freaking out to success. There's various arcs to it. But yeah, I would say, I think people are sometimes afraid just to talk about sort of mundane everyday things that other people can relate to. And so the, the data fresher does not feel confident talking about, hey, I really struggled learning how to do self joins in LinkedIn today, uh, or not LinkedIn, in SQL. And so, you know, can anybody out there help me out? Is there a better learning platform than what I'm using? It's, it's terrifying to say that because you, you think you're gonna look dumb. And there are parallels in every other domain as well. You know, people don't wanna talk about, hey, I made a mistake at work today. Or uh, my boss told me I wasn't doing so great today. That, that's, those are tough things to talk about, but they're very real things to talk about and they resonate. And so I, that's my thing. I try to encourage people. It's like, be, be real about your posts. There are certainly like hot button issues that you don't wanna to touch on. There, there are very personal issues that maybe aren't appropriate for LinkedIn, but um, mm. yeah, if you, you can be real about failure um, especially, you know, it's, it's kind of easy to talk about historical failure or kind of temporary setbacks. Um, tougher to, to come out on the day you get fired and say, I was fired for cause today. Uh, you know, that, that's pretty raw, but, uh, people are afraid to talk about mundane things, about everyday things and about, about real setbacks and failure and, and sort of negative things. And, and they shouldn't be, I, I encourage people to talk about those things. The one thing that I also fa um, went through is that when I passed, uh, the first time I took your challenge, right, the uh, LinkedIn art mode, it was really stressful for me. Like I didn't know what should I write for that day. Mm -hmm. So that time I, I used to write what I, uh, like any failures that I had or any life lessons that I had, then I used to post it because that obviously you learn throughout your life. You, you make mistakes, you are, you'll come out of yeah. it. So that's what, how I approached. So um, now it's it's the opposite. I have now since I've been participating for four or five quart, uh, cohorts, it's I I constantly get uh, content ideas and now it's easy for me. So I yeah. I would urge every viewers to start this uh, start doing this because I've even asked my sister to like start doing this because people have asked me how how are you coming up with ideas. So I I always say that this was the first step I did. Uh, yeah, yes, Albert. So that's really true. And um, and with respect to networking, for for example, a uh, lot of introverts feel this issue, right? Like the first message is easy. You you reach to a person, you say, I am so and so person. I work for this company. Okay, that's mm -hmm. that's all uh, good. But the second, uh, right? The second catch up or how do you how is that possible? Like to actually establish a trust in a new connection? There's a few different ways, and I, I will start by saying I consider myself an introvert as well. The thought of going to in-person networking events terrifies me. Um, I, I would do it if I felt it got me ahead. Um, 
but yeah, it's it's difficult to get past that intro message and start gaining attention. I will say I've not read How to Win Friends and Influence People. It's kind of been on my to-do list for years. Uh, I, I will eventually read it, I'm sure. But just through experience, there, there are a handful of ways, and kind of the biggest one is ask questions. I'll, I'll say there's a big two for me. Ask them questions mm -hmm. that show that you are curious and you know something about them. Oh. Yeah. There's my, my friend that we're dog sitting. Um, so, you know, not just kind of idle curiosity questions, not just kind of dummy questions. You and I meet for the first time and I, and I say, let, let's say you're a, a hiring manager or, or an influencer and I am the, the new entrant. And I say, uh, so Nemo, what do you do for work? Right there, I've just shown you that I don't know anything about you. Um, we just connected because you popped up in my feed and now you're, I've put the onus on you to tell me who you are and why I should get to know you. And that's just, you know, it's just kind of the wrong, it's the wrong approach, I think. So if you are the, the person with hiring authority, or if you are some kind of mover and shaker that, that I want to get to know, the first thing I need to do is go find out about you. And, you know, you are Nima, you work at Microsoft and you are a mid-level manager. And, and so my next, my question to you should not be, what do you do for work? Or, you know, how are you today? Or, I mean, you can do that mundane greetings, but my question to you should be something pertinent to what you do. If you've expressed interest in horseback riding, I can ask, you know, what, what is it about that that you like? Or, um, if you're kind of open with some of the things that you're interested in, ask about that. But but really professionally, um, hey, I, I understand Microsoft is facing this challenge lately. Do you have any part in that or, or how do you feel about that? Um, I understand Microsoft has just expanded. Um, are you excited about the prospects mm -hmm. for the company? So at least that shows that, hey, I, I'm interested in you for a reason and that that I've gone and done my homework and I'm going to engage with you on something that I know that is interesting or relevant to you in your life. So asking questions is the first one. And then that kind of ties in with the other one, which is go meet influencers or, you know, maybe not influencers, but just people that you want to network with to, to get some sort of uh, advantage or, or get something from them. Mm -hmm go meet them where they live. So if a person is on LinkedIn, that's wonderful. But if you see a link to their YouTube and you go to their YouTube channel and that is their real passion, go on YouTube and watch their videos. Ask them questions about that. Start interacting with them there because not everybody is a, a passionate lover of LinkedIn and a kind of a dabbler in other things they may be much more interested in another platform. If they're, if they're posting on Twitter 10 times a day, that's probably what they care about. And you should go engage with them on the thing that they love. That was really informative, uh, um, Albert. So because I, I mean, all of us, we always think on the perspective of networking on LinkedIn, mm -hmm. but this is something new that we can always go uh, beyond and see where the real person like the passion is existing so the the youtube makes sense a lot because now that i'm putting uh, videos on linkedin and i mean videos on youtube it makes sense when people reach out to me there i feel more uh, more happy to like engage with them and then talk through what they want so that that's how i feel what you said i could i could literally resonate with what you uh, say yeah. and um so for the questions of networking, I think you have covered everything with what I had uh, for the questions. And if I talk um, long enough, I'll so just answer the, all the, the questions time. before they come up. You know, that's that's my strategy. Right. <laughs> yeah. So um, so when you said uh, one point I, I got caught is that you said, right, you have to meet the per meet the person where they live. So in my mind, I thought you will have to meet the person physically. 
so yeah. that that like does that for i mean people here uh, in your uh, in, in states right in us you have lot of people together and uh, in this it's the same in india so i can connect with other, another person in india so mm-hmm. uh, connecting through online and connect, connecting through the physical uh, in in i mean physical meetings so um, what do you prefer like uh, is both are the same or do they have their own pros and cons just as an a relatively introverted guy i prefer like initially meeting someone on linkedin i'm trying to get past that i'm mm. you know doing a challenge now where i'm supposed to talk to people face to face i a lot of times i'll i wind up talking to them online anyway but uh yeah it's it's tough to say i'm i'm evolving on this point so yeah but i'm i'm definitely much more comfortable approaching someone on linkedin and then uh most of the people that i met at the alterix convention i had talked to them extensively online there were a lot more people that i then met at the convention and a lot of times it was a a connection from linkedin that i met in person would then say oh you should meet tracen and annie and and so I made a lot of more a lot more in-person connections that I then went and looked them up on LinkedIn and connected with them but uh yeah it's I think it's if you can do both it's best to make it a mix of both if you can and it really cements those relationships I uh Joshua Burkow was one um an Alteryx user and advocate extraordinaire work has worked for Alteryx for years um he was a marine And so he and I met and and bonded on LinkedIn over being Marines and our love of Ultrix and I met up at the convention he's a great guy and so that relationship was really cemented by starting online and then meeting in person so I think those bonds just get really reinforced if you can meet in person uh, so the final thing is like uh, I've seen in your uh, your profile is that you share your availability on Uh, on services like uh, the career coaching career development and resume writing mm-hmm. so this is to inform the viewers like uh, when and how they can um, reach out to you so could you like e- explain or elaborate on how you, they can reach out to you yeah absolutely so the the career services is also kind of a funny story how that started i found myself getting as i sort of grew in popularity i found myself getting bombarded with requests from brand new connections or even non connections for this extensive career advice and that's another thing i would say don't do that even if you if you have connected with someone if you've just connected with them don't ask them for open ended career advice because then you're putting the onus of the the work on them they have to sit there and figure out what you should do in your career come to them with specific questions it's much more approachable it's much more manageable and it just be respectful of other people's time So I started I put together a Calendly page and I started uh charging money for data coaching, for resume reviews, for uh for LinkedIn profile reviews just because I I wanted a way to kind of deter people from randomly asking me for help which became very time consuming for me and took time away from my family. Um and it's quickly became the point where a lot of people were quite willing to to pay the price and I, I don't charge much but they were quite willing to pay mm-hmm. for that advice so then i felt in kind of a reverse engineered way that i should actually give them a really good resume or linkedin or or coaching services because now people were willing to pay for it i do still give i give some free coaching to uh veterans of the military and their spouses. I do occasionally offer free coaching to people. I'll I'll just kind of come out on a Monday and say, "Hey, I'll I'll open three free coaching sessions." I'm still in the business of building that part of my brand and in building a customer base and and a referral base. I've not done a great job of that. But um usually for for established friends, if you came to me and said, "Hey, can you look my resume over?" that there would not be a charge for that um so that there are a lot of people that are kind of in the 
the inner uh, major data circle that, you know, that there's no charge if, if you need help with something in your career or if, if you want someone to scrub your LinkedIn profile or what have you. Also people that complete the hard mode challenge. If you get through 30 days, I do a, a 30 minute session, whatever you like to talk about. I'll look at your resume. I'll review your LinkedIn profile. People ask for all sorts of wacky stuff mm -hmm. from that. So, but um, yeah, it's in anybody connection, non-connection. If you want to jump on my Calendly and, and pull up a slot and, and pay for it, um, I'll, I'll give you the best that I've got. And I, I haven't had any complaints yet, although I, <laughs> I'm still working on the feedback <laughs> mechanism. So that's, that's helpful to know Albert, because um, right now, as you can see, the market is down, people are getting laid off and yep. it's really uh, like all of us. I mean, everybody is like searching for a job and it, it is important to like re be ready with your uh, career um, profile. I mean, resume LinkedIn profile, everything. So uh, what you're doing is really important. And I urge every viewers or the people to go reach out to uh, Albert and get his um, uh, get his advice and I'm, I'm sure that will definitely be helpful because it shows from your experience and your brand as well Albert so uh, that is all I have uh, so yeah that was a great uh, informative session for me as well because um, uh, I I just look into several uh, proper people's um, content and your content everybody but this was uh, a true informational session that I had so thanks a lot. This was uh, definitely a great uh, experience for me to have a chat with you, Albert. Yeah, it was great for me too, Nima. And I, I really appreciate the the insight of the questions. First of all, I mean, this is probably the best interview I've I've ever done. And the thing that I've noticed in doing quite a few of these interviews now it's, it's been a while. I, I was thinking, I was trying to think of the last time I've been on a podcast. It's been a few months. Um, the thing that I notice is that I do some of my best thinking and sort of processing by being put on the spot and being asked these questions and even kind of knowing some of the questions that were going to come up, it's difficult to, to really suss out what I, I'll, I'll get together some thoughts, but there's just something about being sort of put on the spot and asked a good question. You kind of go. Hmm. Yeah. I'm, I'm, there, there's a processing that occurs at that point under that pressure, like we talked about earlier, that you just can't replicate anywhere else. And so I really appreciate the opportunity. I very much appreciate the, you know, the insight of the questions that you asked. And uh, yeah, I had a great time. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Albert. I hope you have a great uh, weekend. Yeah.